It's a Blood Red podcast, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo. I'm Guy Clark. Welcome along. Well, the end of the season often offers time for reflection and thought of what has been achieved. And here on this edition of the Blood Red podcast, we have a special guest who will exactly take us into mental fortitude and mental health and everything that goes along with it with a arduous and long campaign. We've got uh, Jack Jarvis with us, who has gone through an unbelievable feat of rowing from mainland Europe across to the United States in North America, taking 111 days. Of course, we'll talk about Liverpool being a Reds supporter as well. But Jack, thanks a lot for joining us. And as I say, do you want to tell the listeners a bit more kind of about the challenge you undertook and, and the reasons why? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thank you so much for that intro. So like you uh, said there, on the 3rd of December, I set off from Lagos in Portugal. And then 111 days later, 12 hours and 20 minutes, um, after rowing 4,630 nautical miles, I landed in Florida and I became the first person in history to row from mainland Europe to mainland North America, solo, unsupported. And the reason I did this um, was to challenge myself and also to raise money for Brain Trust, which is a brain tumour charity, in memory of my granddad, um, Budgie, who died of a brain tumour in 2007. So, yeah, I had a really good inspiration for doing it. Um, I'm really happy to get the record. Yeah, no, it sounds an unbelievable achievement. I mean, a lot of people w w would kind of say run a marathon or, or something like that type of thing. But to go through what you did there, I mean, as you say, unaided and, and, and able to kind of do it solo. I mean, just how... How much planning went into it in kind of the, the first thing? And I mean, what gave you the idea that this was the challenge that you felt was best to, to undertake? Yeah, so Guy, I'll, I'll, your first question, it probably took me about 18 months to plan and raise the funds. So um, in total, I think it was around £80,000 I had to raise through corporate sponsorship. I ran raffles, um, fundraising events. I actually ran a marathon in the build-up carrying a rowing machine to raise money to buy the boat um so yeah i would have been done there that would have been oh, <laughs> I, I, I can't even think about running a marathon so yeah hats yeah. off to you but yeah sorry to jump in it was um no no it's it's pretty nuts and you, you almost forget i almost forget i did that you know um you know not only running a marathon but with a rowing machine and then it, it was up in a hill up in in lancashire in clitheroe uh, pendle hill so um yeah it was pretty it was pretty hardcore um so that was that was sort of the how I, I executed the row and got to the start line. Um, the reason I picked rowing, so obviously being in the army, um, you know, uh, two four commando. So um, being commando trained, I couldn't go. I couldn't just do a marathon. You know, my mates were like, you know, why should we sponsor you to do that? So I had to really go think outside the box. Something that was really challenging, and what's more challenging than something that's never been done before? Um, you know. 4, 000, I thought it would be 4,500 nautical miles. Um, it actually ended up being a bit longer, 111 days in line. So no one could really sort of go, okay, you don't deserve a fiver. You know, I'll, I'll definitely stick some money in the charity pot. So that's sort of how, why I picked the row. Um, also, a big shout out to my mate, Duncan Roy. It's probably all his fault because he, he rode the Atlantic uh, solo. Um, no, sorry, he rode the Atlantic as a team of four. Gave me a presentation in, in the back in 2017. So... He inspired me to um, to row an ocean. So yeah, that's sort of the how and the why of, of why I ended up rowing the Atlantic solo. Logistically as well, I mean, you say you set off in December and you completed it by March. I mean, uh, is that is that the most dangerous time <laughs> to kind of sail across? I Obviously, mean, just... you know. So um, you know, don't don't get it twisted. The you know the South Atlantic in December is certainly not like the Mersey um in december so i actually grew my dad lived in old swan um so i know about the harsh northern winters uh, uh that we endure in this country so the reason the main reason you go that time is so the south atlantic's different season and also core hurricane season is september october so the least chance of a hurricane is is november well not november but december january february march so that's why you go there because you know big force five hurricane your little seven meter rowing boat is probably only going to be one winner and it's not going to be me and Budry, i tell you that guy no definitely i mean you say it took 11, 111 days i mean 
just take us into that. I mean, you're looking in great shape now. I'm sure you were in great shape at the time. There's pictures of you, kind of the, the beard really grew out, obviously, whilst you were whilst you were rowing across. But take us kind of inside your journey. I mean, when you when you set off, how how far into it was when you realised actually just how much of an undertaking this was? I'm sure you were you were expecting something very very challenging, but but how did it compare from your expectation to the reality of it? Yeah, you know, I'm not being funny. After the first three hours and that land disappeared, I was just like, oh, God, what have I, you know, what have you talked yourself into this time, Jack? Um, it was it was, it was, was really tough. It was a, the best way I think to describe it is a grind. Um, but I really tried to frame my mindset before I started. And every day I'd, you know, I'd maybe say, wake up and say, Jack, this is going to be the toughest thing you've ever done, you know, you know, never sort of was blasé about it, treated the Atlantic with the respect it deserves, um, you know, especially doing it solo. So when I got out there, you know, because I'd maybe check my emotions and not gone with an arrogant approach, I was, I was, when it was, when it was tough, I, you know, and I had those dark days, I always used to sort of try and turn, turn to myself and Jack said, you knew it would be tough, mate, you know, so what did you expect? So that's how I was able to stay positive, um, not saying that it wasn't challenging, especially that first two weeks, guy getting used to that isolationism, you know, being on your own, um, learning, you know, bits and bobs about the boat. Because obviously in your training rows, you certainly don't row for 11 days straight. You know, the, the most I did was uh, two two days. Oh, not By the way, that's not just two days training. I did, you know, multiple two days. Um, so yeah, you know, those first two weeks were tough, but once you sort of frame it into your mindset that you that you've got a job to do, you just get up every day for 111 days, work for 14 hours, go to sleep, and just repeat. And then before you know it, you're in Florida. I was going to say, how did uh, I am? I, I, I can only imagine, but I do imagine that after you, you say there, you, you're three weeks or four weeks, a couple of months, you you hit that routine of just right. This is the this is the day. This is how I work through it. I'm I'm really fascinated. How did kind of the the rest periods work? Because if you're solo and as you say unsupported, surely there must have been a huge amount of anxiety. You're out in the middle of the ocean that, that something whilst you whilst you're resting could could, could yes, go wrong. Totally. Um, but you always try and mitigate those risks, guys. The ones the the one ones that you can control and the ones that you can't control, you've just got to work hard to put them to the back of your mind and remind yourself that there's nothing you can do about them um so that was quite good and then another way if anyone's having trouble sleeping that listens to the pod try rowing 14 hours a day and you'll soon uh that insomnia will soon disappear you know i get in that cabin um and just fall straight asleep funny story obviously when you prep portugal you know you think about life rafts survival suits your rations your spare oars your spares for your water maker um and in all the sort of you know bedlam of the pre-row stuff i actually forgot a pillow so I did 111 days without a pillow and still had no trouble sleeping. So, yeah, you'd be amazed that what that 14 hours of rowing will do to you. Yeah, no, I'm sure there must have been kind of physical exhaustion. Now, I, I find it interesting as well what you said before about kind of that getting used to that isolation period of being by yourself. You set sail in or, or set off rowing in in December when it was probably for the rest of us, when we were only really getting back to the groups of normality, having been in isolation for so long. How yeah. how did how did COVID and the pandemic, I mean, play into it? I mean, was was that when the planning started during the first lockdown or were you already doing your fundraising? And, and what impact did that actually have in terms of your whole operation of, of, of getting prepared for setting, for going off rowing? Well, it certainly it affected me the same as sort of maybe affected everyone. You know, it really turned everything upside down. Um, so I started planning this in, uh, well, I said I was going to do it in early two, 2020. And then obviously lockdown. So it made it really hard to get money. You know, companies that had money and didn't want to give it away. Com a lot of companies didn't have money to give, you know, because of COVID. Um, some companies had money. But because uh, they had staff on furlough, they were like, you know, I had a couple of conversations about like, Jack, mate, we can't give you, you know, five, five grand when we've got, you know, two, three, four employees on furlough. It just doesn't look right. So, you know, different challenges, other things as well. So um, I couldn't get a visa for America 
because uh, they weren't issuing them at the time. So I had to just go over on ESTA, which turned out to be the wrong visa. A few little problems in America, but a big thank you to um, my PR team, Nifty, and the US border controller. They actually squared me away and, and I um, didn't end up getting detained for being an illegal immigrant. So just little things like that. Um, the ferry as well over, you know, it was touch and go whether I could, I could go. Um, having to get vaccinated, all these sort of um, things. So yeah, it just added another added layer of difficulty. However, you know, we can sit and talk about how we can't do something, you know, and I think a lot, maybe too many people do that nowadays. We look at how things can't be done. If I was trying to approach a problem and think, right, how can it be done? You know, how can we work around it? It's got to be a way. We can't just give up. So yeah, made it a little bit more challenging, but you made the victory all that sweeter. Yeah, would have been the biggest, the ultimate kick in the you know where's if you'd got to America and they'd gone back on your boat, Jack, across you go again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not getting in here. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, that, that wouldn't have been good. But you, you mentioned there kind of that resilience and stuff. And I mean, mental health is a, is a big talking point these days. And as you say there, in terms of how people approach things. But I suppose with what you've gone through here, you flip it on its head. It's, it's not mental health in, in that regard of how stable mental health situation is it's mental strength isn't it of yeah. just ensuring that you power through and it doesn't matter how how deep how bad things get I mean the Liverpool anthem you'll never walk alone kind of feeds to within that as well of you do just keep continuing and you you had no choice did you I mean you're you're unsupported if you halfway through had gone uh, actually maybe bitten off a bit more than I can chew here. You, I, I suppose within, I, I'm sure you had contingencies in place, but the way in which you'd set this up was there's no chance I'm not going to get this completed. Yeah, 100%. And that's how you've got uh, you've got to be when you take on these sort of challenges. But I, that was one of the reasons I did this role. I wanted to inspire people, you see, Guy. Um, nowadays, I think we shy away from hardship we try and do so much to avoid that hardship in our life. You know, I always use the use um, not the expression, but like, you know, nowadays we don't even have to get off our, you know, backside to go to the kitchen to get a takeaway menu because it's in our phone. We've removed so much hardship um, from our lives. And I think it's actually a bad thing. And this isn't me saying everyone's got to go out and row the Atlantic solo, not at all, but you know, you need to challenge yourself. You need those hard times because, you know, life is hard it's not fair you know you are going to have ups and downs but if you expose yourself to this hardship you know you'll be ready for it and when these hard times come in life you'll be like ah this is easy because i've you know i've done x y and z you know when the chips were down you can you can rely on your mental strength so yeah i definitely believe you know we need to be maybe a little bit more hardship in our life and i love a good saying that iron for iron and it's true you know those tough times make you tough so, yeah, I'll definitely. Um, and that's what I'd love to do, you know, maybe work with some people that need a little bit of help that have got it in them. Because I honestly believe most people do have it, have it um, physically. They just need it up, up and mentally. They need to unlock it. Yeah, no, definitely. Hats off to you completely. Let's let's talk a bit about Liverpool. You are a, a big red yourself. And I suppose yeah. I imagine when you when you set off, the Reds were winning. When you got back, the Reds were winning and maybe had a had a Carabao Cup with them by the time you you'd got back. But what did you make of the, the season for, for Liverpool? So uh, it's yeah, it's it was a strange one because obviously I knew we had the African Cup of Nations. And um I've got to be honest, guy, I was sort of like, you know. I didn't think it would go as well as it had. So uh, my expectations, you know, we two of our best players go to the African Cup of Nations. I remember I get the few updates, and I remember when my mates told me, I was like, "Oh, who's in the final?" And they were like, "Egypt and Senegal." I was like, oh, "Brilliant!" You know, our t- not only are both our best players gone, they both made it, played the mo- most amount of games. Um, so yeah, for to come away with a domestic double, I mean, to be so close to the quad. And not get it is obviously gutting, you know, but it's okay, let's look let's look at the league, for instance. You know, Man City, um, you know, a great side, you know, a great manager, but he needs hundred million pound players to play his way of football. You know, they've got Jack Grealish, he sits on a bench. And, you know, we didn't do bad, you know, 90, uh, 90 plus points is amazing. And we didn't lose the league on the last day, you know. You could probably look back to, I think we needed to do better against City. Um, 
you know, maybe win the home game, draw the away game at the Etihad. The draws against Brighton and, and, and Brentford, but, you know, you can't argue with, you know, 92 points. It's amazing. And then, you know, you look at the Champions League final, it just wasn't, wasn't our night. You know, uh, Courtois played an absolute blinder. Um, Ancelotti set his team up, counter-attacking. And, and I hate this sort of, oh, but we, you know, three finals, we didn't score a goal. Well, Chelsea were in two finals and they didn't score a goal either. Um, you know, and Real Madrid was set up super defensive and, and the only time they counter-attacked, they had, I think they still had like seven players behind the ball. So, you know, it's just one of those things. That's football. I'm sort of, I wouldn't say I'm over it now, but it's funny. We um, we went to the pub Saturday and that's what you miss as well when you're out in the ocean. You don't miss any of the, you know, the flash, like your nice cars, your designer club, but you miss going to the football, with, going to the pub with the the boys are watching the footy and it's funny my mate said uh he's like you left pretty sharpish after the end final whistle and i was like yeah he's like well you're sulking and i was going to come out with some answer like nah nah i think i, think I just you know felt on well and i just went nah i was 100 percent sulking i just wanted to go home to bed so um yeah sort of over it now but yeah I'm, i am happy with the season and i think most Liverpool fans are i mean are, are you happy with the season how it how yeah it i mean it's been an incredible, as you say, an incredible journey and ride for for Liverpool in, in terms of competing in every game. And uh, I think it kind of the, the chat we've had, and I mean, speaking about kind of that fortitude to just keep going. You look over the last what three, four seasons now for Liverpool, the points tallies that have been put up are absolutely unbelievable, especially in consideration of the the challenge they're up against. Now, of course, last year was very different with the injury crisis with no fans in the ground. But the the, the three seasons there have been fans in, I mean, the points tallies of, of being above 90 points in all three of those campaigns and only winning one league title is absolutely mind-boggling. It's ridiculous, you know, and it's just we have come up against a Man City side that have got a, a great manager. Um, I don't Obviously, I don't think he's as good as Klopp because... You know, not only uh, Pep needs, you know, a certain type of player, you know, 60 million for Diaz, whatever. I mean, you, you could argue, argue um, like Van Dyke, but look at the player, he, you know, Sadio Mane, you know, we got him for what, off Southampton. Um, Salah, you know, Klopp turns these players into 60, 80, 100 million pound players. Um, but yeah, we're just up against a really, a really good manager, a really good side. And, you know, that's that's what's made it so interesting, you know, and some of those games that we've played against City have been, you know, incredible, aren't they? You know, I remember the 4-3 a couple of seasons ago um, in the league. It was amazing, you know. So, um, yeah, it's really, like, really proud of it, proud of this Liverpool squad. Um, it's just a shame that uh, we've also, there's also a very good Man City side in the league at the same time. Yeah, two teams kind of that uh, I imagine in years to come to find the generation of Premier League football we're seeing. I mean, very early days, the season finished less than a week ago. But how do you already kind of see it ahead of, of next season? Sadio Mane's future seems to be far from certain right now. Do you do you buy into this kind of rhetoric that there's a rebuild in the offing for Liverpool? Or, or kind of on the flip side, you look at the amount of younger players in the squad who are already established players. You think of Trent Alexander-Arnold, Canate, who's coming to the side this season, Jota and Diaz are, are 25 each as well. It doesn't feel maybe outside there's kind of a bit of negativity being thrown Liverpool's way of not scoring in three cup finals, of only doing a domestic double, of which I'm sure 18 other clubs in the Premier League would have bitten your hand off to do this season. And and, and yet there is the feel that maybe because Mane's going, because Salah's got a bit of uncertainty around his future as well, that a rebuild is in the offing. Um, yeah, I don't... A rebuild seems so dramatic, doesn't it? You know, like you said, Luis Diaz, and he was another one I'd get updates while I was on the water. And people were like, mate, have you, have you seen this Diaz? And I was like, no, obviously I've not seen it. And <laughs> everyone was like, everyone's like, mate, he's a baller. Like, he's so good. And obviously come back and I've seen him and he is a great player. Like you said, you got Jota. Canate, I think he played really well um, in the Champions League final. Um, yeah, I thought he was his top draw. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm unsure. I, I think Mane will go. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a football agent. I'm not as dialed in, but just his body language 
Um, I know there's answer here about Salah, but he said, you know, I want to stay. It's just whether he gets the contract um, that he wants. Um, but it'd be interesting to see. I mean, I, I personally, I don't, I'd like to be interested in your opinion. I would pay Salah what he wants because I just think of who are we going to get to replace him? Um, you know, it's, it would cost you, well, I know we got Diaz for 60 million, but yeah, I just don't know. But yeah, who, who, who would be yeah. getting to replace Salah? No, I don't, I don't think both players can leave. I, I've long held the view, really, that one will sign a new contract because Firmino's in the same position. One will go on a free and one will be sold. And I, I think, like you say, Mane probably is the one you can get the best fee for and probably not do as much damage to the overall team. I think Salah is unique in that regard. I think Mane, whilst he's probably been the best player of the running, I think Jota, first half of the season, showed just exactly how good he is. And I think there would be capable replacements out there to find to play in that centre forward role that Mane's kind of taken. Diaz is is the first choice on the left now. Salah, I think, as you say, it, 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 obviously it's not our money and there's a certain economic way in which Liverpool is set yeah, up. Yeah. But I, I would say you reinvest the, the, the fee that you get for Mane into a new contract for, for Salah and effectively that's that's a signing in itself of securing his future. And Firmino, I would imagine, would probably be the player to walk away on a free at the end of next season because likelihood is, is the sell value you get for him as to what he offers is probably not much in it, is there, um, as to, no. to what can what can be done. But before we wrap up, Jack, I just want to finally kind of say to you, first of all, congratulations on what you've done. Give you an opportunity just to let people know where, as you are still uh, fundraising for your efforts, over £65,000 raised, I believe. You may well have even smashed Six, that. 66. 66. Yeah, 66, so, yeah. 66 and a half. Yeah, let, let people know where they can, can donate and, and, and then following that, what's the next challenge or is that you reached out and you don't know what to do next? So, yeah, so everyone, um, if you could give us a follow on Instagram at United We Conquer, the link's in the bio. Also on Facebook, Jack Jarvis. Um, and, yeah, the link will take you straight to the Just Giving page. I totally understand. It's been a tough year for everyone, but, you know, two quid, five quid, it all helps. And um, I met with the charity yesterday and interestingly, they have had more inquiries from people suffering with brain tumours and cancer, uh, brain cancer. It has doubled every month since December, since I started the row. So the money's going um, to a really good cause and they're helping more people. Um, so yeah, it, don't worry, it's going to an amazing cause and anything you can give, if you can, um, so I know the cost of living is, is ridiculous at the minute. So yeah, massive thank you if you can give anything. Um, and the next challenge, I don't know, um, I have to get together with my team, um, Nifty, because um, we've got some crazy ideas. You know, I'm, I'm doing a, an ultra marathon in Chile at the end of the year, but something for next year, maybe the Indian Ocean, um, or maybe potentially swim the Mediterranean. <laughs> it's getting banded around, crazy, something like that. But yeah, I'll, uh, we'll back we'll butt heads, uh, me and the guys. Butt heads, is that the right word? Put, yeah, put but our heads yeah. together. Yeah, put our heads together, uh, me and the guys at Nifty Cons, and I'm sure we'll come up with something weird and wonderful, and hopefully you'll have me back on, Guy. Um, maybe this time next year we'll be sat here as quadruple winners. That's the dream. Yeah, 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 no, exactly, because I suppose it's one of those things where it completely, completely unimaginable to, to, to me to be able to, to know even any human, I know I, I definitely couldn't, but any human could actually undertake what you did. Hats off to you completely, but I imagine it only does whet the appetite to then go, actually, what other limits can I push myself to do? And as you say, we'll, we'll have the link to the to the um, Just Giving page in the description, but equally, I suppose what you were saying there, whilst the money is so important for what you're raising, the cause you're raising it for, equally as important as that is the awareness that you are drumming up and building upon and as you say inquiries into the charity of people actually making sure they are seeking help for for what is a very very serious condition yeah yeah totally and that that's that really um really uh put a smile on but maybe feel good when they told me that you know because you give all this money sometimes oh where is it going but you know to hear people are getting you know the help and and they're, they're really a, quite a small charity in the grand scheme of things. 
a great story. So Helen and Peter, their, their daughter had a brain tumor. They needed all this money to fly her over to America. I think it was about 20,000 pounds. They ended up raising 70. So they were all right, what are we gonna do with this other 50? They started this charity and yeah, just um, just to hear that they're helping more people is, is absolutely amazing. So yeah, the money and the awareness, are, they go hand in hand and it's amazing. Yeah, makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, definitely. Well, Jack, appreciate your time. And as I say, probably eating into any training time for your next venture. Hopefully we, we can get you back on the pod. And as you say, next year, a quadruple to celebrate for the Reds as well. But that's it for this edition of the Blood Red podcast from myself, Guy Clark and Jack Jarvis. Thanks for your time and your company. It's bye for now. Cheers, guys. <laughs>